I'm very happy to see so many familiar faces um, from our previous online programs and happy to see some new ones uh, as well. Uh, many of you know that uh, Julian is um, one of our most treasured colleagues and guides at Paris Muse. Um, he is someone who really um, has a calling uh, to share his deep knowledge and passion uh, for the history of a city he knows uh, as both a resident and a uh, scholar. Um, Julian studied history and art history at the Sorbonne and his coursework there focused on ancient and medieval. Uh, although today uh, his stroll will be focusing on uh, an area in Paris that was largely transformed in the 19th century. And what Julian will be doing today is really giving us um, a uh, live version uh, of a much longer tour that he does in person called Rebuilding Paris. And so um, when you all are able to uh, get to this city that we all love um, in person, I'm hoping to do that during my winter break, uh, I can highly recommend um, his Rebuilding Paris history, which is uh, like all of our walks really designed to um, give you a solid understanding of how the city developed and why it looks the way it does uh, today. Um, I'd also like just to take this quick moment to say that um, the program today is a chance for us to uh, get back in our online program mode. We've taken a brief hiatus from online programming, although we have been you know, offering our in-person tours uh, over the summer and the fall. Um, we have uh, gone back to the drawing board, so to speak, and uh, re sort of ramped the online programs we were offering last spring. But we've also created some new ones that really focus on planning and preparing for a trip to Paris and France. And so um, Julian, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions you have today. You can put them in the chat. Um, but Julian will also be uh, leading some live online programs, um, not strolls like today, um, but programs uh, that are uh, interactive and with small groups where you can ask questions. Um, he's got a host of really great programs, you know, pro tips for figuring out how to do a day trip to Versailles, for example, uh, a program that's all about kind of you know, you have five days in Paris, like how could you possibly choose? Um, so they're really sort of designed to give people whose trip, it might be the first time in Paris or it might be the 10th, um, but you would like that great opportunity to really communicate with someone who knows the city well uh, and can help you make the most out of your precious time um, when you do get to, when you do get to go. Um, so I'm going to just turn this over now to uh, Juliana. Bonjour, Juliana. Hello. Bonjour, how are Juliana. You? Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I, are, you're not too cold today. I see you have your your your. Well, it's it's you're okay. It's, yeah, it's getting colder. I mean, we're in the middle of the fall. We're heading for winter, and uh, the weather is pretty good today in Paris. There's a beautiful light, an autumn light, a fall light. And so it's uh, it's a great day for a stroll through the Palais Royal and through Paris, really. Well, we're excited, Julianne, as always. Uh, this wonderful treat of sort of starting our day um, with a with a with a stroll with you. So thank you for doing this, and um, we are, we are all yours. Thank you for joining. So uh, I wanted to uh, meet you here at the Palais Royal, which is a uh, Parisian's favorite to uh, maybe escape the uh, buzz and the hustle of the city. It's, uh, uh, it's almost a, a small city within the city here uh, and a beautiful palace. It used to be a palace built by Cardinal Richelieu uh, in the 17th century. We're just across from the Louvre. Um, I know that uh, you may walk by the Palais Royal and not get a chance to see the sheer beauty of the place here because yeah, there's just a small passageway, an arch passageway that you may see in the back over there which takes you into onto a square uh, with nice cafes. And um, yes, most people stay outside of the Palais Royal on the square for the cafes uh, after a tour at the Louvre. But I really suggest you cross, you walk through the archway and get into this most beautiful palace. 
again built by Cardinal Richelieu because Cardinal Richelieu wanted to be close to the Louvre. The Louvre being the royal palace back in the day. Uh, the French kings lived at the Louvre before the Louvre became a museum during the French Revolution in 1793. So Cardinal Richelieu, when he was prime minister, he decided to uh, build uh, or to have his palace built here. So he just had to uh, cross over uh, to the Louvre and meet the king uh, in the royal apartments. And the uh, palace uh, was uh, uh, named Palace Cardinal, obviously, because uh, uh, it was a cardinal of the Catholic Church. So the palace was known back in the day as the Palace Cardinal, but it became Palette Royal. Um, it became Palette Royal just after he died when he decided to give his palace to the king. He stated in his will that he would donate uh, the palace to uh, the uh, uh, former King Louis XIII, who only died one year after Cardinal Richelieu. So it's the young Louis XIV. Uh, and I'm sure you're, uh, many of you are familiar with the most famous king in French history, the Sun King, the king that decided to build Versailles. Uh, king Louis XIV was only five years old when, he, when his father died. And he's the one who inherited the, the, the Louvre Palace because it was the main palace for the French kings and also the Palais Royal uh, as a child where he lived a few years with his mother, Anne of Austria, and with the prime minister of the time, an Italian cardinal, Cardinal Mazarin. So he spent a few years here and unfortunately was the victim of an attack in the Palais Royal. So uh, as he grew older, uh, he became a sort of um, uh, wary of Paris. And also um, he decided that he wanted to leave the city behind. So um, Louis XIV is the one that decided to move the seat of royal power from Paris to Versailles. And he picked Versailles because he loved going to Versailles as a teenager. So the Louvre was left behind. And of course, the Palais Royal was left behind as well. And uh, not long after the court had moved to Versailles, he decided to give the Palais Royal as a present to his brother, Philippe of Orleans, the Duke of Orleans. And the Orleans family, Philippe of Orleans and his descendants, the Orleans family, remain the honor of the palace for 200 years uh, into the 19th century. So even after the French Revolution, the Orleans were able to keep the property. Um, and uh, it was only uh, uh, in the second half of the 19th century that the palace was confiscated by the French state, by the French government, uh, uh, when uh, France uh, turned into a uh, republic uh, towards the end of the 19th century. So the Orleans family, uh, loved uh, staying here uh, at the Palais Royal. They loved being in Paris. They thought it was much more fun to be in the Palais Royal in Paris because they could throw lavish parties, invite many people to join those beautiful parties in the palace that you see straight ahead. Uh, the, uh, the core of the palace is the, the, the palace that you see straight ahead that was rebuilt in the 18th century. The oldest part of the palace is this part I'm showing you now, which is the... Uh, the, uh, the, that, 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 that wing to the left, if Cardinal Richelieu came back to Paris today, he would most uh, uh, recognize the, uh, that part of the Palais Royal, which is in, in the exact same style he saw, or the exact same style that the palace was built uh, at the time he commissioned the construction of his palace to Jacques Le Mercier. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the newly part, the newly built wing of the Palais Royal is that very Baroque, French Baroque uh, uh, wing. Uh, which is now the Constitutional Council. Uh, the Constitutional Council in France is, um, in the legal system in France, it would be the equivalent in the United States would be the uh, Supreme Court. And the oldest part of the palace is now uh, housing the uh, Secretary of Culture. So uh, it's uh, very different from uh, uh, what uh, the palace was designed for uh, before the French Revolution, even though the third part of the palace, that wing to the right, now houses or has been housing for quite a long time the National Theater, the French comedy. Uh, Moliere, if you're familiar with the very famous French playwright, Moliere, Moliere used to perform on stage in uh, Richelieu's palace. The theater was redone, was rebuilt, uh, refurbished over the years, and especially in the 19th century. But the Cardinal Richelieu was a big patron of the theater. He loved uh, the theater. And so um, uh, uh, the troops, Moliere's troop in Paris performed in uh, Richelieu's palace. Um, 
Julian, oh, I for- Julian yeah, before, yeah. You, yeah. before you leave that beautiful courtyard that we were just in, do you want to tell us how you feel about the mix of the Baroque architecture and the history that you're telling us about and that contemporary installation? Those uh, people right. are probably wondering those black and white kind of posts by the French artist uh, Daniel Burin, which is obviously people are enjoying them today. But um, you want to tell us a little bit about the sort of clash between old and new and how you feel Absolutely. about it? Yes, that's right. So the, the Palais Royal is a great mix of different architectural style, French classicism for Richelieu's uh, palace, the Orleans who redesigned the palace in the Baroque style with the beautiful columns. You can see on uh, the second level of the palace with the great windows and the, the beautiful columns with the scrolls, the volutes on top, beautiful statues on the uh, upper floor with the vases. And of course, great clash in the 1980s when uh, President Francis Mitterrand and his Secretary of Culture, Jack Lang, uh, commissioned a contemporary work of art to Daniel Byrne, as you said, Ellen. And so, of course, it's, a, as you can see, uh, a very uh, uh, audacious and uh, a very contemporary work of art inspired by ancient Greece. The columns are supposed to be a reminder of the uh, beautiful columns of the Greek temples. Uh, they're in white and black marble coming from the uh, best quarries in the uh, Mediterranean world, really just like the, uh, the, the, the marble that the, the Greek sculptors employed, uh, used and worked with in the ancient times. But of course, it was a, a, a huge controversy. Uh, the whole project was very controversial back in the 1980s. People opposed the project thinking that it was a great clash. Uh, it didn't fit uh, inside the courtyard of such a prestigious palace uh, in the history of Paris. Um, as I said, the Olin's family were really a, a, a special bunch uh, in the French aristocracy. Um, Versailles was considered very stiff uh, uh, and uptight. People had to behave according to certain rules. The name for it is the etiquette. So you had to behave in Versailles. And in Palais Royal, you could basically do whatever you wanted. Uh, the Olin's family uh, were really... Uh, 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 free, uh, and they wanted to give freedom to their guests here uh, at the palace. Um, just to give you an idea, the uh, Orleans family managed to uh, ask the king to forbid police from entering the ground of Palais Royal. Police was not allowed to enter the ground of Palais Royal. So there was a lot of illegal activities going on, not just the crazy parties, but also a lot of illegal activities going on. Uh, in the arches, uh, in the galleries uh, uh, that I, I'm about to show you, I will walk through one of the galleries. Those galleries were added later on. Told you about Philippe of Orleans, the brother, uh, and now I am uh, here in the garden, uh, surrounded by those beautiful apartment buildings that were built at the end of the 18th century by another member of the Orleans family. He was another Philip. It makes it easy and kind of confusing because the uh, most, uh, uh, many of the uh, first male uh, sons in the Orleans family were named Philip, just like the first Philip of Orleans, the brother uh, of Louis XIV. So there was another uh, Philip who was Louis Philip of Orleans in the 1780s. Uh, he was the head of the Orleans family. The Duke of Orleans lived here at the Palais Royal. He was nicknamed Philip Equality because during the French Revolution, he voted for the death of the king. He was the king's cousin at the time, uh, descending from uh, Philippe the brother. So at the time of Louis XVI, the king that was guillotined during the French Revolution, uh, Philippe and Louis XVI were cousins. And uh, Philippe was nicknamed Philippe Equality because he was, uh, 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 played a role in uh, Louis XVI's trial and actually voted for the death of Louis XVI. And so um, Louis, uh, sorry, Philippe of Orleans, as I said, uh, uh, lived such a grand lifestyle, such a lavish lifestyle that the Orleans family, most of the time they were broke, we'd say today. And so in the 1780s, upon advice from his counselors, he decided to start what we'd call today a real estate development. That was, that was uh, uh, that's really what it was uh, back in the day build arches, galleries with cafes and shops and restaurants all around this beautiful, most beautiful French garden uh, designed in the French style with the fountains, with the alleys. Uh, you see those uh, trim trees, uh, typical of the French garden, the statues, 
uh, the lawn. You can't walk on the lawn. That's why you see people sitting on benches. Uh, so the, uh, really a garden that was designed uh, uh, in the French style, just like the Tuileries garden or the Luxembourg garden that we also strolled uh, with some of you. And so I was uh, telling you about the illegal activities that were going on in the cafes uh, and in the shops all around the, uh, the garden. What was going on? Gambling. Gambling was forbidden in the city of Paris, but people came here uh, to play games uh, and, um, and play with money, of course. And there was also a lot of prostitution going on. Men came here uh, end of the afternoon, in the evening, and they met uh, with those ladies who were waiting for uh, their, uh, uh, for this gentleman. They were waiting here under the arches in the galleries, and they would take them just above the stores. There are some, um, there's workshops just above the stores. Uh, and some of them uh, were uh, furbished. So I will stroll through some of the, uh, I will take one of these uh, galleries. They were uh, the first, uh, they, they were the, the, the really the first shopping mall. It was really the first shopping mall here in uh, Paris in the 18th century. Uh, for 30, I'd say for 40 years, almost, from the 1780s to the 1820s, the Palais Royal was the happening place in Paris. People flocked from all corners of Paris because they wanted to see the Palais Royal, they wanted to be seen in Palais Royal, and they wanted to shop the most fashionable, uh, the most happening boutiques here. In this space I crossed, and I'm actually walking back to it because I want to show you, the very first shopping mall in France was right here, in between those two uh, alleys of columns. You see the columns and the beautiful lanterns. And so in this space here, uh, there was a uh, glass roof. Uh, it was actually built in wood. It was not in stone back in the day because they had to, they wanted to build a, a gallery very quickly. Uh, and so they didn't have time to build it in stone and they decided to uh, build it in wood. And against all odds, it, it, it stayed for 40 years. They did not rebuild the uh, original gallery in wood. They did not uh, transform it into a stone gallery. And so for 40 years, people came here. There was three, three passageways actually under a glass roof. And this was really the, uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, shopping. Uh, the, first of all, it was a, the greatest shopping uh, area in Paris and the first shopping mall today, what we'd call the shopping mall. This was here in the Palais Royal. And then they could also, the, the gallery is gone. It was knocked down in the 1840s. It was uh, too much um, dilapidated, uh, worn out. So they decided to uh, knock it down. It was also, people started to leave the Palais Royal behind. They wanted to go further north where I'm taking you next in the covered passageways. Now the, it's true that the galleries of the Palais Royal ran, went down the hill all throughout the 20th century. And it's only, I'd say, maybe 20, let's say, 30 years ago that uh, the uh, city of Paris tried to revive uh, uh, some of, well, tried to revive the galleries around the garden and try to attract uh, the um, uh, independent designers. You won't find the big chains here. You will find mostly interior designers, fashion designers. Uh, there's a great perfume shop also. You see that some of the shops, most of the shops are closed now. It's Sunday. Um, it's not a, um, it's not an area of Paris where you will find shops open on Sunday. Uh, it was mostly during the week on Saturday, of course. And uh, as I said, again, uh, mostly independent, uh, stores, uh, not the likes of those big chain stores that you find around the upper house, uh, in the, uh, in the theater district on the big boulevards and, uh, around the upper house. Um, but some of the shops are actually great to explore. Uh, I, I think it's a great place to spend a, a sunny afternoon uh, during the week on a Saturday. Come see this most beautiful perfume shop, Serge Lutens. He's one of the greatest perfumers in Paris. Paris is known for the food, the gastronomy, of course, the fashion, but also for the perfumes. And uh, Serge Lutens is really a, a great perfume store. They uh, kept... The, uh, they actually restored the original decor of the 18th century. Uh, I really uh, suggest you go in to check the beautiful spiral staircase in the boutique, the beautiful wainscoting on the walls that they repainted in pink and purple. And of course, uh, 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 ask a uh, salesperson to uh, make you smell some of their greatest perfumes.
uh, inside that uh, very pretty boutique. Back into the garden, uh, you will see people sitting by the uh, beautiful central fountain. Oh, a lot of Parisians love to come here. Again, uh, it's mostly, uh, it's, it's very quiet here and compared to uh, uh, the rest of the city with lots of traffic. Uh, you see people pulling out chairs and uh, bringing some books or uh, bringing some drinks. Also, you would find that in the summer, people bringing food and drinks and enjoy a sunny, uh, sunny afternoon in, uh, in the summer here in the French capital. Oh, there's a temporary exhibit now going on. I see people shaking some of the photographs. I see huh? some pictures, temporary exhibits. Something uh, part of the uh, Palais Royal. I'll try to make a, uh, the Palais Royal again a, a happening place for shopping and for art. The introduction of contemporary art by Francois Mitterrand was also the start of the uh, collaboration uh, between the Secretary of Culture and contemporary artists who uh, um, uh, have their uh, uh, exhibits displayed here in the garden or in the, in the building. Yes, I was telling you about the apartment building. So basically it was also part of the real estate development, not just the cafes and the shops, but also apartment buildings that the, all the Olin families, the Olin family was able to sell in, uh, to sell to wealthy families, basically. There were wealthy families living here in the uh, uh, 1800s, at the beginning of the 1800s, where, when the apartments were sold. And uh, uh, now uh, the uh, Palais Royal is still a very sought after place to live, a very exclusive place to live in Paris. Huh? Uh, only uh, people with lots of money, uh, uh, with uh, ve very wealthy people would be able to afford an apartment here overlooking the garden at the Palais Royal. First of all, because most of the apartments are huge apartments with high ceilings, so the typical uh, classical uh, uh, apartment, a uh, Parisian apartment with beautiful classical architecture, the molding uh, on the ceiling, uh, the, the windows, the large windows overlooking the garden, and also the, uh, the, the, the price. Huh? Prices in general in real estate, the real estate prices in Paris have skyrocketed in the last few years. The Palais Royal has always been a very uh, exclusive, uh, upscale residential area uh, to live in Paris. But also, as you say, Julian, remarkably, you know, just open to the public. You know, I, I don't know if everybody sort of understands kind of where you are in relation to the rest of the city and how exceptional this quiet oasis is. But, you know, I know you know this area really well because you give so many Louvre tours. Yeah. And, you know, the, you're literally like a two, two minute walk. Right. From, oh yeah, that's from right. The Louvre. So Absolutely. It's really, oh, yeah. it's really an uh, when you say an oasis. I just wanted to sort of point out to people. You know, I know from from years of guiding, and and you probably do this too, Julian. You might come here to have a, a quiet uh, sandwich, right, in between a morning Absolutely. tour and an afternoon oh, tour I do the Louvre, right, just to escape Absolutely. from the crowds. Yeah, there's a great cafe just outside the Nemour, which is, I think, a great cafe, very Parisian. You actually find a lot of guides who go for a coffee, uh, even a pastry, a sandwich, a salad, just outside the Palais Royal. And also you will find a lot of people, Parisians, on their lunch break, taking a sandwich to the garden and, and enjoying the garden, yes, on a, on a chair by the fountain, on a bench here in the garden. So yeah, absolutely. And the Louvre is really uh, just uh, outside. It would take me a few minutes to get to the Louvre, which is a completely different place. Lots of people, uh, uh, very busy, uh, lots of noise. Also, there's the Rivoli Street, which is very busy with traffic. Well, not anymore because they decided to uh, actually cut down the traffic on uh, Rivoli Street now, but uh, Rue de Rivoli. Uh, but uh, as you said, Alain, really, it feels like uh, you're in an oasis here away from the city, uh, away from, uh, especially in the heart of Paris, especially in the center of Paris. You would find quieter areas in the outer districts in Paris, but here we're in the very center of the city, which feels a little uh, uh, unusually uh, uh, quiet and almost calm here. Yes, absolutely. So I'm, I'm actually uh, showing you some of the beautiful architecture because I think it's uh, really, uh, what French architecture is all about with those beautiful plasters 
uh, the uh, uh, capitals with the scrolls uh, and the foliage, uh, the beautiful the scrolls, the garland of flowers, the vases, the men's art windows, the uh, slanted roof, typical of French architecture covered in the blue slates, typical of Paris. So really, it's uh, uh, one of the best examples of classical French architecture in the city and even in the country, I'd say. So I wanted to show you a cafe in particular, Café de Chartres. It was Café de Chartres in the 1780s. Uh, uh, during the French Revolution, it became Grand Véfour right here in the 1820s when the place was bought by Jean Véfour. And it's one of the top-notch restaurants in Paris. It's a very famous restaurant. It uh, retained uh, the decor. I don't think you can see through the, it's closed today. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, it's open for lunch and it's open for dinner. It has the beautiful enamel panels on the walls with the scrolls. It's inspired by, it's actually what we call Pompeian art. With the, with the discovery of Pompeius in the 18th century, the discovery of those villas, of those ancient uh, Roman villas buried underground after the volcano uh, destroyed the city, the discovery of those villas really had a great influence on, on European art in the, uh, in, in, in the second half of the 18th century. And the decor, if you go to the Grand Vefour, I mean, it's worth going for the food, obviously, because there's great food served uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Grand Vefour, but it's also a great place for history and art, for the decor and for all the famous people that went there for lunch. Napoleon uh, went to the Grand Vefour for lunch. All the famous writers, many famous writers in the 19th century, Victor Hugo, Emile Zola, uh, the great names in French literature went to the Grand Vefour for lunch or for dinner. In fact, when you go to the Grand Vefour and when the waiter or the waitress takes you to your table, most of the time, and I'd say always when they can tell you what table you're sitting at, they will tell you you're sitting at the table of Victor Hugo or you're sitting at the table of some famous French revolutionaries. So it's a really a great experience, I think, to uh, go to the Grand Before. From what I last checked on the menu, they changed the, uh, the menu. It was a um, very expensive place, of course, to go for lunch or for dinner. But uh, from, uh, it's, it's showing here, and I see people checking the menu. It's all changed now, and it's much more affordable. They made it uh, more, especially uh, because of the COVID pandemic, the crisis. Uh, so many of the restaurants were closed for many months. People, uh, uh, of course, it takes time to see people coming back to uh, uh, all those great places uh, in Paris, all those great cafes and restaurants. And so they decided to uh, um, offer a, a new menu, which is uh, uh, much more affordable than what it was. Uh, I can see here that you can have lunch for 45 euros. There's a menu 45 euros and another for 57 euros, which is very different. Huh? Uh, before the COVID pandemic, you'd had to, hmm, let's say, uh, uh, probably think of uh, spending 200 or 300 euros for a dinner at the Grand Vefour. Um, the Grand Vefour is a great example of why Paris is the city of high gastronomy. It's, um, you need to think that before the French Revolution, those wealthy families that the aristocratic and noble families employed, hired, chefs to work in the kitchen and serve delicious food on the table of the aristocratic tables of those beautiful private mansions in Paris and the chateaus in the countryside. And after the French Revolution, because many families had to go into exile, uh, the aristocracy was, uh, the monarchy was abolished, the aristocracy was abolished, and many staff working for those families were left with no job. And so after the French Revolution, they thought, what can we do? I mean, we know how to cook but we have no one to serve. And some of those great chefs took over some of the cafes and especially here in Palais Royal, that's what happened with the Grand Vefour. They took over those cafes and turned them into restaurants. And the menu, the word menu comes from there. The menu that they served at the private mansion or at the chateau because those families uh, 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 required menus from their chefs. They offered the same menus at the restaurants to patrons who would pay for the lunch and pay for the dinner. And they could, uh, uh, make a living out of their gift. So I'm taking a side street now because I want to take you to a passageway. Beautiful, maybe one of the most beautiful passageways in Paris. 
So Julian, if I may, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate how, you know, you're, you're turning our attention to another kind of history of Paris. You know, we often think of um, political history and the history of architecture, the history of art, um, mm -hmm. but you're really focusing us today on things like, you know, the history of commerce, the history of shopping, the history right. of, of gastronomy, right? These histories of, of experiences of how people um, enjoyed the city really, you know, explains a lot about how it looks. And I just wanted to let people know before we go into the Galerie Vivienne, you know, if you want to read more about the history of these amazing, um, amazing places, you know, the English word that you would search for um, covered passageway doesn't really kind of, you know, capture how elegant these amazing uh, galerie or passage really are, right? These are, these are very unique, I think, Vivian, what you're about to show us to sort of the history of shopping as a, as a luxury experience, um, but also as, as, as kind of a democratic one, right? Because these, are, these were open public spaces um, they were. That, that anyone then and now can go into, right? Absolutely, they're open to the public, just like they're still open to the public, just like they were back in the day. Uh, the golden age of the covered passageways, the 1820s and in the 1830s, people started to leave the Palais Royal behind there were lots of, again, real estate developments all over the city, especially in the 1820s and in the 1830s. Those, the area that I will be walking you through was completely redeveloped uh, with beautiful apartment buildings. And the idea was to have passageways, um, um, covered streets cutting through those buildings so that people could uh, get shelter from the rain, from the cold. Those passageways were lit up at night. Uh, you uh, could also get uh, someone dusting off your shoes and your coat upon entering the passageway and you could go on with shopping at uh, the uh, beautiful boutique stores they specialized in four different items. Uh, there was uh, uh, fashion, of course, luxury goods, the food, you would find delicatessen shops. Uh, and uh, um, an interior design as well, furniture you could also buy uh, for the house. Now it's a, it's a little different. It has changed over the years. You would find more of the designers now, some bookstores. I will point uh, some of those uh, great shops that you can find in the gallery. Vivian Gallery, Vivian is one of the most beautiful, built in the 1820s by a businessman uh, who uh, also financed the construction of apartment buildings. And he's the one, Marshu is his name. And he, did, he financed, sorry, the construction of uh, the uh, passageway that I'm about to enter to get in uh, to now. Uh, and they also uh, 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 put on the Christmas lights already. I know it feels a little early. Uh, there's a great, can you, can, is, I know that the connection can be a little sketchy here in the, um, in, uh, in parts of the gallery. I, I think I'll be fine, but can you still hear me fine? Is the connection? We're great, Julian. The connection is beautiful. Ah, uh, great! Because I wanted to tell you about that uh, great wine shop. This is one of the best wine shops in Paris. It's also a wine bar, and it's a great place for wine tasting, also. So, if you're interested in uh, uh, tasting uh, some of uh, the French wine from Bordeaux, Burgundy, Côte du Rhone, I think it's a great place. Le Grand, Lucien Le Grand. You can see the name here on the screen. Uh, and it's one of those great wine bars and wine shops here at Gallery Vivienne. Uh, just let me, uh, uh, just let me, uh, yes, show you the glass roof. Because of course, those passageways were copied after, were designed after the glass roof gallery at the Palais Royal, which was the model for those passageways. They, of course, so many of those businessmen knew and shopped. Uh, uh, the wealthy family shopped at the Palais Royal, so they wanted something similar, a passageway that enabled them to walk from the Palais Royal, where people still live now, where the, the wealthy families still live in and around the Palais Royal, but they wanted to get to the boulevards, where I'm taking you last on this program, because they wanted to get to the boulevards where you would find all the theaters uh, and all the nightlife. Uh, the nightlife was uh, actually... Uh, bustling on the Grand Boulevards uh, uh, at the end of uh, some of those passageways that were meant to connect the Palais Royal to the rest of the city or almost to the outskirt of the city at the time. If I can show you a traditional Parisian bistro, I will try to show you, just make a little detour. 
You can see the tables here. It's also a great option for lunch. I always suggest some of my groups too, because it's really the kind of uh, bistro you will find Parisians uh, having lunch, uh, uh, a lunch break. Even people working in the area, you would find Parisians uh, stopping here at the Bougainville. The Bougainville is a great, you can I actually see Parisians yeah. Yeah. They're not tourists sitting here at the cafe, at the restaurants in Bougainville. You know, it's tucked away uh, from uh, uh, the Palais Royal. Well, not far uh, from it. Uh, just walk, uh, you could see me walk from the Palais Royal to here, but it's uh, actually a sort of a uh, hidden street, a side street. It's named after a navigator, a sailor, uh, Bougainville, who explored the Southern Pacific for the French king. Uh, for Louis XV in the 18th century. Uh, Bougainville uh, is in French history what Cook is, James Cook to uh, the uh, uh, British history. So back into the, the gallery, Vivienne, because I want to show you one of the most beautiful bookstores, a great bookstore. Um, slow down a little bit. Hope the connection is still good because I know that in the archway sometimes when I'm under the glass roof, I get good connection and you can see the decor. Can you see the caduceus and the, uh, uh, and all the details, all the symbols, symbols of business because the caduceus is a symbol of God, God Mercury uh, in Roman mythology and he's the messenger God, but he's also the God of business. And so this gallery, of course, is all dedicated to business, showing that France is a very prosperous country, a very wealthy country. Mm -hmm. Through all the business that the country is uh, making with other countries, and also the Parisians uh, favoring all this business, buying all the luxurious items, making Paris the city of luxury, the city of luxurious, luxurious goods. Mm -hmm. The cornucopia, replenished with fruits and vegetables, symbol of prosperity also. And the... Uh, the spades also, symbol of of the sh all the ships that unload precious items and precious goods coming from all over the world, flooding Paris with luxurious items. Uh, this is an uh, uh, this is a very old book store. I know that they have a selection of books in English also, so you may be interested in checking some of the older books. Uh, postcards. Uh, usually the uh, shop owner here has the stalls outside huh? uh, the, uh, the boutique, which makes it uh, typical of uh, the old bookstores in Paris. So the windows were uh, restored a few years ago with the uh, glass and wood facade of the stores, making the gallery Vivian uh, look like uh, the way that it was back in the day, huh? bringing the gallery Vivian back to its uh, past glory when it was built in the 1820s. Julian, I would just point out that, you know, for, for those of us who, who, who love to shop in Paris, that bookstore that you just showed us is a really great place to kind of buy souvenirs when you're yeah. there that are Absolutely. really just unique and, you know, affordable and, you know, Absolutely. not the kind of typical stuff you get at really kind of more, you know, more, more, um, tourist trade kind of shops, right? And there's a, a beautiful right. uh, children's toy store in there. Um, it looks really expensive, but you can actually find <laughs> find some fairly affordable things, especially, you know, like old maps and, and, and books that I feel like make really wonderful souvenirs. There's a great mix of, of different stores. I'd say, of course you will find there's an antique dealer here. So obviously the prices will be maybe a little more expensive than um, the bookstore. Yes, the bookstore, the toy store, uh, the wine shop also, they're pretty much affordable. Yes, absolutely. And great, place, great places to buy souvenirs. Uh, yeah, typical uh, souvenirs, not the, uh, the, the tourist uh, souvenirs that you will find around the Eiffel Tower uh, or near Notre Dame, but maybe something a little bit more, a little bit more expensive, definitely, but still affordable and of better quality. Um, also something you can't find at home. And something that you can find at home, certainly. Uh, I know the place doesn't look so good because there's scaffoldings. It looks like a big construction site, but uh, this uh, most beautiful palace, because it's also, uh, it used to be a palace, Cardinal Mazarin's, told you about Richelieu, 
the next prime minister after uh, Richelieu was Mazarin, and he bought this uh, most beautiful palace, which is now the seat of the National Library here in France. And so they are actually there's there's two palaces. I can't. There's another palace just behind this one. So there's two palaces making the site, uh, the older site for the National Library in Paris. There's a new site with modern buildings in Eastern Paris, which is the uh, largest site for the National Library. But this is the most presti prestigious site for the National Library because this is where you find all the manuscript books and all the precious items and precious objects owned by the National Library. They are refurbishing, renovating, uh, restoring. It's been uh, going on for 10 years. The first part of the palace, I mean, the, the palace that's just behind this one is open now. Uh, to art history students, actually, uh, La Bruce Hall, which is a, a stunning, you can see a picture of it here, a stunning uh, a, a glass and metal structure uh, built in the second half of the 19th century, a beautiful decor, um, hundreds of seats available for uh, art history students uh, because the uh, library uh, specializes in art history. And the second uh, part of the um, uh, renovation will be completed next year. And uh, uh, that part of the palace, Mazarin's palace, will be open to the public. The Mazarin gallery is absolutely outstanding. It will be restored with beautiful paintings by the best uh, 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 painters of the time. And uh, it will be housing a collection of precious items owned by the National Library. So there will be temporary exhibits. So really, if you are interested, I really suggest you go see the National Library. It's not just a place for, I mean, where, you, you, where you'd need a, a, a subscription or a reading, a reader's card to get in. But uh, the idea now is to open the library to more people, to a larger uh, public, and have people come and see the beautiful collection of the National Library and some of its most beautiful galleries and, and rooms inside the palace. I'm so glad you're showing us the National Library, Julien, because I must say, when I started Paris Muse 20 years ago, because uh -huh. that's the library where most people who are working on art history PhDs and writing their dissertations and doing their research, right. they, that's this is where we go, right? So Absolutely. this is old haunt for me. But it's actually where I met most of the original educators and guides for, for oh, Paris wow. Muse because they mm -hmm. were fellow <laughs> they were fellow right. graduate students working on their Absolutely. PhD. So that's a it's an important <laughs> site for for all of us who um who treasure you know all the resources and the history of art because it's really a learning a learning Absolutely. empire over there. And a beautiful place. And still and you still you're right in the center of Paris, next to the Palais Royal, on the way to the Grand Boulevards and to the upper house. So it's really worth a stop. And I think it, yes, it will be open to the public uh, uh, next spring, I think most likely April or May 2022. It was delayed. The whole project was delayed because of the COVID, obviously. Uh, it should have been open by now, but it will be open by next spring for sure. In the meantime, I can really plug the online exhibitions that the National Library has online, and they're, and they're also in English. Yeah, they're 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 amazing. I mean, the exhibitions alone. A lot, a lot of people, you know, are so focused on going to the big museums in Paris that they don't know that the just around the corner from the Louvre, smaller the National museums. Library has these smaller, really targeted exhibitions that you know don't have any crowds, and they're really quite amazing. Right. Oh yeah, I think it's really worth checking some of the smaller museums in Paris where you don't get the crowds of the Louvre of the or or the Orsay or even the Pompidou. Yeah, and, and Julian, I can't wait to work on this program that we've been talking about sure. for, for, for weeks, right? Which is yeah. exactly that, you know, we're, Julian yeah. and I are working on an online program with Vera as well, which is like recommendations for these smaller, kind of less hectic museums. You know, you've, you've done the Louvre, you've done the Orsay, now, now what, now what? Um, because the, the layers right. of offerings are, are endless in the city. Um, so I'm really happy that you, you, you reminded us about that um, Richelieu Library. Thanks, Julian. I wanted to show you some of the avenues here in a newly developed area of the 19th century because most of the buildings I was showing you just before were buildings of the 18th century or the beginning of the 19th century. And the city was completely transformed starting in the 1850s. Uh, over the span of 20 years, Paris was completely transformed. 
by a man who left his name in history, especially here for us French people, and especially for Parisian people, Haussmann. Uh, Haussmann was a, uh, he was a sort of a mayor in Paris. The title was different back then, but I will just say he was mayor of Paris in the 1850s and in the 1860s. And basically what he did is that he transformed the whole city and made Paris a modern city. Um, he worked for Emperor Napoleon III, and Emperor Napoleon III had a vision for Paris. Napoleon III had spent most of his life in exile. He spent some time in England, in London, and London had become a modern city uh, through the reign of Queen Victoria. And as he returned to Paris, he found out that the city was just in a poor state of dilapidation, uh, crumbling down houses, uh, narrow streets, very dirty and dangerous at night with no streets lead on at night. And so he had a huge project to transform the city and make Paris the most beautiful city in the world. And he hired a man that he met in Bordeaux because at the time Haussmann was mayor of Bordeaux. Um, Haussmann had made a great impression on, uh, on uh, Napoleon III, who said, I want you to move to Paris and I want you to lead those projects. And uh, Paris was a big construction site for, for more than 20 years because even after Napoleon III was defeated, um, and even Haussmann was actually fired after Napoleon III was defeated. What Haussmann had started lasted, continued for another 20, 30 years uh, until the World War, until World War I, the First World War, uh, broke out. And most of the city, I'd say half of the city of Paris that you see now, and, and, the, Paris, and, and the city that people come to see in huh, Western Paris uh, is uh, old Haussmannized. His name became a word in the French language. Uh, um, this is the, the building that you see with the Rhode Island balconies here, right there to the right. That's a Haussmannian building. Um, we use the word Haussmannian in French. And most likely if you go to a real estate agent and you say, I want to buy an apartment in Paris, one of the first questions he will ask, do you want a, a Haussmannian apartment? Do you want to live in a Haussmannian building? And that's exactly what you see here uh, with the uh, Rhode Island balconies. Uh, the, the, it's also, the, 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 the Haussmanni and the Partman building is uh, uh, standardized with rules, standards, uh, the height, the number of floors, uh, the boutique uh, on the uh, ground floor, the workshop just above the boutique, the noble floor is the uh, third floor with the higher ceiling, uh, the wrought iron balcony that's uh, 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 running all along the floor. Uh, and then it goes all the way up to the maids' rooms for the maids that worked for the wealthy families on the, uh, in the lower floors. They had their rooms under the roof covered in blue slates. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, all the uh, facts that you learn on the Rebuilding Paris tour. Now, of course, uh, we spend more time talking about Haussmannian Paris uh, architecture uh, and the uh, Haussmannian buildings uh, uh, throughout the tour. Just wanted to stop here also to say just a few words about the Paris Stock Exchange. That's not in use, any, uh, not in use anymore. It's not, uh, uh, it's not open anymore, but it used to be the uh, seat of the Stock Exchange uh, uh, in, uh, from the 1820s to the 1980s for quite a long time. It was the, the construction of the Stock Exchange was decided by Napoleon I, who commissioned the construction of the Stock Exchange to Brongniart, that's the name of the architect. We even call it Palais Brongniart. You will find the Palace Brongniart. That's the name of the place, the palace. Because Napoleon wanted three palaces, three temples. Actually, Napoleon used the term temple. He said, I need the Temple of Law, which was the Bourbon Palace. It's still there. It's the uh, House of Representatives in France. We call it National Assembly. He wanted a temple for the great army to celebrate the victories on the battlefields that he won. And uh, uh, he uh, wanted a temple for that. And it's the Madeleine Church. It's now turned back into a Catholic church. And he wanted a temple for money. And that was the stock exchange that was inaugurated in the 1820s, which is right here. So the whole area is Bourse area, which is uh, the stock exchange area. Now, in the 1980s, they decided to digitalize uh, the, 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 all the, um, I mean, the, um, the system. Uh, through computer. And so uh, the stock exchange is not empty. I don't know what will come out of it. I mean, it's been years and there's been talks about what uh, they would do with the building, turn it into some sort of museum. It's still uh, not decided until now. A lot of uh, also uh, 
you see a lot of works going on scaffoldings. The city is uh, actually, uh, again, uh, maybe not as much as it was uh, at the time of Haussmann, but you see a lot of construction sites all over the city because the city is getting ready for uh, the Olympic Games of 2024. So allow me uh, to walk another couple of minutes before I get to a second passageway that I want to show you. It's a little different from Vivienne. It's maybe not as uh, glitzy and, and, and chic, just like the gallery Vivienne, but it's actually the first passageway that was built at the very beginning of the 1800s. So it was built at the time Palais Royal was still the happening place. Gallery Vivian was not built at the time, but the passageway of the Panorama, it's inside just like all those passageways, they are built in apartment buildings. Huh? It's kind of funny to think that you're just going through. Yes, that's right. This gate here, and you can see the light in the back, and I'll be inside the oldest passageway in Paris, which is not so much for shopping. I'd say you'd come here for leisure, entertaining. You'd come here for the cafes and also for, for food, for the, the, the restaurants as well. Uh, they turned an old printer, Stern. Used to be a, a, a printer. The, the shop was just beautiful and they turned it into a fancy Italian uh, restaurant here. There's also a traditional Par Parisian bistro here, as there. So you would find some of the uh, old, there's the old Parisian cafes and, and bistros. Uh, there's the back door of the Varieties Theater. Uh, the boulevards at the end of the passageway are filled, they're lined with theaters, which is basically the theater district in Paris. Um, see the... Uh, the passageway has not been restored yet. Has not been restored yet, the way Gallery Vivian. There's a great tea salon, which retained the original facade. It's all carved. You see the wood facade is carved with all the beautiful details. You can see on flowers above the arches, the pilasters uh, on the glass facade. So Julian, your, your image is, is going in and out, no doubt, because you're inside the, the passage. Um, but I just wanted to just interject that, you know, all this great information you're giving us about um, Hausmann's renovations and the ways in which the renovation made Paris more of a livable city. But in many ways, as you're telling us, it also made it a, um, a, a destination for commerce and shopping, right? It was a business model as much as, a, um, as an aesthetic one, right? And um, I, I thought that maybe... Uh, folks might like to know that a lot of our programs, in fact, including yours, um, the Rebuilding Paris Tour, but a lot of our programs actually talk about this great renovation project because, for example, you know, all this Impressionist art that we love so much with scenes of cafes and theaters and Grand Boulevards, those are all examples of how art, to understand the art of the, of the of this period, you also have to understand what you're telling us about, which is how the city was was really transformed. So I just have to make a plug here. If people are interested in learning more about um, 19th century Paris and, and why it is such a fundamental history, um, there's also a really great impressionist online tour that, it, that one of John Lee, Julian's colleagues, uh, Amanda, is offering. Which will, will, which will give you another way to learn about this um, amazing 19th century history of, of Paris. Absolutely. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Ellen, for sharing this about the Impressionists, because of course, Haussmann transformed the city at the same time Impressionists started bringing art to a new dimension. 
you know, leaving Paris, going, taking the train to Normandy. I'm thinking of the, all those train stations that were built uh, in the second half of the 19th century, at the time the city was transformed. So it's all part of the same history, the Impressionists, Haussmann, Napoleon III, the cabarets. Uh, at the time that Paris was really the center of the world, the art world, the uh, entertainment world. Uh, and uh, you can feel it here as you walk on the Grand Boulevard, because those boulevards were laid out by Haussmann. They were meant to be a place of strolling, shopping. Uh, uh, the, the covered passageways were actually at the time of Haussmann. And I, I hope that the image is still good. And that, that it you is, can see it is. We can see you now, yeah. Uh, the passageway is uh, kind of old here at Panorama, so I know the connection is now uh, uh, maybe... Uh, Again, a little sketchy. Now, there's another passageway. I could, I could go on with two more passageways. You could walk all the way down to the bottom of Montmartre because the, there's, two, there's another couple of passageways taking you down to the, uh, uh, the bottom of Montmartre. Um, and so, yes, those, those, those passageways are cutting through this uh, newly built area of the 19th century. Um, and, and then Haussmann decided to move the center of commerce of business towards the upper house, which was supposed to be the showcase of the second empire. And those boulevards were meant to be a place of strolling uh, through the city, shopping, going to uh, 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 theaters. Also the, uh, the boulevards are lined with theaters uh, and grand cafes. Um, and, um, and of course the, uh, the boulevard I'm walking uh, on now is taking you uh, to uh, some of the uh, greatest department stores in Paris, Gallery Lafayette and Fenton, who would soon replace the old passageway. Uh, uh, we started at Palais Royal, where the uh, really uh, where shopping started in Paris in the 18th century, going through the passageways of the 1820s and in the 1830s, the golden age of the passageways. And then at the time of Haussmann, Parisians would see the rise of those giant department stores where people were also Welcome to uh, walk through and uh, browse uh, a, a, a tremendous selection of items and goods huh? in the Gallery Lafayette, in the Pantin, and in the Bon Marché on the left bank as well. I'm walking down some more uh, on the boulevard, and uh, I will stop somewhere a little quieter because those big boulevards are very. Uh, busy with traffic and uh, there's uh, much more noise i'm sure you can hear that as i'm walking down this most famous boulevard in paris i'm walking towards the upper house so what i can do is that i can maybe take a few questions if some of the uh uh of our listeners uh, want to ask questions i can take a few questions try to answer them as i'm walking down towards the upper house and sure, show you some of the magnificent if anybody wants to put their question in the chat, I'll 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 relay them to you, Julian, because I know walking and reading in the chat at the same time is a little bit of a challenge. But if anyone That's has right. any any questions for Julian and you want to just type it up in the chat, I'll be really happy to ask him. So Julian, I just have a quick question. In your in your Paris Gardens um program that's coming up, one of your online yes. uh tours. Um, that's another way to sort of learn more about the way 19th century Paris history really determines the look of Paris today, right? I mean, talk a little bit about the renovations that led to all the extraordinary gardens. Is that right? Is that, there's Haussmann Absolutely. in that as well, right? There is a whole chapter on Haussmann's Paris in my gardens program where, I'll be, where I will be uh, talking and sharing information on the beautiful parks uh, built by... Um, the man who was in charge of the parks and gardens at the time of Haussmann, his name was Alphon, but he was a great uh, uh, colleague of Haussmann who was in charge of laying out beautiful parks uh, for the imperial crown for Napoleon III. So on the gardens program, I take people to the Vieux Chaumont, which I think is the most beautiful uh, park built during that great time of the Second Empire uh, uh, of Napoleon III's reign in Paris. I agree. That's a that's wow. That's a that's a Parisian favorite, Boot Chamal. Absolutely, sure. it is. Yeah. yeah. So um and and while we have all these uh these folks online, I I will just remind you that you know um the dates for Julian's online programs um you know if they don't work for you uh, they are uh, recorded 
And so, um, you know, signing up for one of our online programs also means that you receive a recording of it um, within uh, 24 hours. Um, if you are all, if you are online with a few friends right now, um, you know, we can do that for you uh, again, if the date doesn't work for you, if you wanna make it a, a sort of private online party with your friends and family, um, we are, you know, working with folks to, um, to provide those experiences. You, you can just get in touch with our amazing uh, general manager, Vera, who's on this call. And thank you, Vera, for setting this all up today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Julie and I have to say, as always, uh, your live strolls really kind of reactivate my uh, love for Paris and um, and really my admiration for uh, your storytelling and the way you bring your your city to life. Um, so I wanted to, to thank you again. Um, I don't think we have any uh, questions. Someone had an earlier question about why certain areas of the city were so quiet. I mean, we can see obviously there's cars now um, going up and down the boulevards, but some of the places you 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 took us to were were quite um, calm, not a lot of traffic. Um, yeah. Do you would you say that this is a, this is pretty typical of, of your experience of Paris right now? Well, there's uh, different factors uh, for uh, some of the streets being very quiet at the moment. Uh, you saw that Palais Royal was actually pretty busy with people walking and strolling. Um, then some areas I walked through, uh, some of the stores were closed down. So maybe uh, you wouldn't see so many people, uh, especially um, um, in some of the, the, the back streets behind the National Library. There's also the fact that uh, people are actually on holiday vacation right now. Uh, in Paris, there is a uh, school vacation, holiday vacation of two weeks, and uh, people will be coming back tonight. So because uh, kids are going back to school tomorrow, Monday. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, probably one of the reasons why uh, some uh, yes, of the streets are not as busy as they are, or as they will be uh, uh, as from tomorrow and next week. Yeah. So Julie, we have another question. Can you just confirm so everyone can hear you nice and loud what, what boulevard you are on right now? You can, you're yes. just passing the street sign, so. <laughs> boulevard des Italiens, which is one of the first boulevards built uh, to lead to the, uh, the upper house that was being built at the time. So the whole area around the upper house is a showcase of Haussmann architecture. Oh, I mean, now all the buildings that you see, especially now, uh, all the buildings that you see all around me, they're all Haussmannian buildings. Huh? And they're all leading, all these boulevards are leading to, leading to uh, the beautiful Opera House, which is the masterpiece of, of a French, uh, 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 the Second Empire uh, and Napoleon III's Paris. Uh, so a really great area to explore. I have to say that on my Rebuilding Paris tour, what we do is that I take you to the Opera House, huh? Obviously, and I also take you to the Gallery Lafayette to see the beautiful cupola in stained glass windows huh? and to see, of course, some of those historic department stores. So that's also part of the walk and of the tour, uh, Rebuilding Paris with Haussmann. Well, thank you, Julian. Today, you, you, you also introduced us to, to, to a central concept of, of Parisian life. Because today you were really a flaneur, right? You were that's right, exactly. This wonderful, yes, this word. wonderful word, yeah, um, that is so so central to Parisian history. Uh, flaneur comes from the word for stroll, right? So Julian yeah. is really being a flaneur today, um, and you know that comes up in so much literature, so much art, so much history, yeah. um, and reminds us that Paris was really um, designed for this experience, right? This experience that you're sharing with us today. Um, it's a, uh, you know, a walk in the city um, in order to really experience the city, right? That's all, that's, that's one of the things I think um, everybody who's been to Paris really, um, that's our, a universal uh, pleasure that we all have. Just walking through the city is, is really the best way to experience it. That's being, right. a, being a flenner, or if I may say so, sometimes a flenner's, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. And as I'm walking down the boulevard, you see I'm, uh, the uh, scaffoldings and the uh, commercial reminds me that uh, there's a great movie coming out on Eiffel, the engineer that built the Eiffel Tower. And they say that it's a great movie coming out so soon in movie theaters here in French. Uh, the scaffoldings Wonderful. are, uh, yes. Uh, so we'll see. I'm looking forward to seeing it. 
and learn more about our great uh, engineer Eiffel that made uh, Paris even more famous all over the world with, uh, with his great tower. Great masterpiece of uh, engineering. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for joining my program. I hope to see you soon for another live program through Paris and also uh, for our great uh, programs on News and Connect. Thank you, Julia. Au revoir. Bon après-midi. Merci, au revoir. Bon après-midi. À bientôt. Au revoir. Ciao. Thanks, everybody.